Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, in many cases, software assistance represent a set of program, related program rather than a single program, and then we call those uh, systems program families. And for this program family, what we first do is we try to configure the program family and get a single program, sort of run our own um, platform and it depends on certain library. But since these pro um, program families are distributed in source code, so what we first have to do is we try to build and install the program before we can use. But unfortunately, this uh, process broke out <coughs> frequently. And if you ever want to figure out what the problem is, and then you find that the error message is um, very hard to read and to understand, like the message uh, presented here. Then the question is, um, how do um, software system develops can potentially avoid this problem? So the obvious solution is that um, they generate all single programs and then apply this building and uh, installing process. But this is infeasible for several reasons. And the most uh, um, critical reason is the feasibility of uh, com uh, computational. Um, because um, think about that we have 100 um, options in this program family and uh, for each option we can have yes or no then um, this will not finish in like um, 20 or 30 years. So then what can we um, do to this problem? So let's look at this abstract view. We kind of begin with this uh, very of program or we call program family. And then as we see that we make di different selections, we got different programs. And if we apply analysis, we got different results. And then we have already seen that this path is impossible to um, ensure some properties of the program. But actually, an alternative path has been taken by the researchers from um, variational software. So what they do is they have uh, this variational analysis, and they directly apply to variational program. And in that case, we get a variational result. And interesting enough, if we make the same selections into both the um, program and the result, then these two paths converge. So, this shows that the uh, ordering of whether we make a selection first or we apply the corresponding analysis first doesn't matter. Um, but um, the more interesting question is, where does the VA come from? What well, traditionally this is manually um, crafted by um, lifting the analysis for a single program. But in this book, we kind of introduced a framework that are kind of lifting the analysis that are expressed in type system and then the output is the variational analysis for the um, variational program. And this is also the outline of my talk. So we first look at um, this variational analysis and its benefits. Uh, this is a um, variational program for the um, find example. So here you'll see some uh, special notations. This is called a choice. And a choice kind of consists of a dimension. This is its name of the choice and also the alternatives of the choice. Uh, you can think about this choice as macros, but they are kind of more disciplined. And in this um, rational program, we have two dimensions. The first dimension deals with the first argument. So basically, we can say whether we want to pass a um, value that is x, or we want to pass in a credit card that is p. And the second dimension deals with the result, which can return a single element that is find or the list of elem all elements that are find. Um, so in many cases, we want to generate a single program. So what we can do here is we kind of um, do this selection. So basically, we specify which alternative from um, each dimension we want to select. So based and here is the example that we want to select the first alternative from both uh, dimensions. And in that case, basically, we replace all the choices with their corresponding first alternative. Like in the first line, we have replaced arg x p with x. And then we can do the same thing for other decisions. And here are kind of all possible plane programs. Now to see the um, advantage of variational analysis, we look at uh, variational type inference, which can be directly applied to this variational program. 
and which yields this relational type. And this is not surprising because we know that a different um, selection result will have different plane types. Now, if we select the corresponding selections from both the relational program and the relational type, we get a single program that is of that particular type. And if we apply this type inference, then we find that they have um, so the type converge. So which shows that we can know some property of the single program without generating them and uh, apply the plane analysis. And we can do the same thing for the um, other decisions. And finally, if we select a second alternative from both arc and the rest, then we find a type error in this, um, in this, in, in this type. And if we look at the original um, plane program, we see that um, we want to access X, but which is unbound. But in fact, we don't have to generate all these single types and inspect them. We can look at the back of the uh, original type, and we see that the type error is already there. And we can also info which location caused this, this error. It exactly corresponds to rg and the rest too. Um, so this is kind of a static view of relational program, and actually there are some dynamic use, and the idea is called a program by search. So suppose we are given a, a single program P, and we apply this analysis, and we get the result R prime. But suppose the intended result is R, which means um, the analysis result is incorrect. Either the analysis fail, or we don't get the correct result. Now, um, the question is, how do we change the program P and then we can get the result R? So, we can kind of introduce um, a lot of variation into the original program and then we create a variational program. And then we can now apply this variational analysis to get this variational result. Now, from VP and VR, we can decide which um, program um, that is closest to, to the original program P, and uh, uh, when apply A, the analysis results are. Um, so, which gives us the kind of suggestion about how to change the original program P. And then we have used this idea to develop the technique called um, type error debugging. So, here's kind of the benefits or the use of variational analysis. And uh, now let's look at how we create variational analysis. Uh, traditionally, this is done manually, and which involves four steps. The first step is to, to add a uh, variation to data structures. Um, so because now we kind of represent the analysis of a set of programs rather than a single program, now if assume we originally have uh, lists for our analysis, then we end up with variational lists. So the variation can be both in the values of elements or in the list structure. So the list can um, now be arbitrarily nested because um, variation uh, can be nested. Now we also have to adapt the analysis for these um, variational data structures. So we got this, if we foresaw we got this variational sort. And uh, we can imagine that um, de designing a variational sort algorithm is not a simple task. Now once we have this um, analysis, we need to show its correctness. So essentially we needed to show that um, this commutation relation, basically we say whether we apply the analysis first or we make a selection first, this um, converges to the same result. And this is again kind of not simple. Um, in our operational type inference work, it's kind of about 15 pages of proof. So um, in the last step, we kind of have to evaluate the performance of the um, variational analysis, and which involves generating kind of convincing benchmarks and also applying the analysis. So um, let's look at a concrete example about how we obtain um, variational analysis from traditional analysis. So we first have to add variation to both the syntax of the expression and the type, and then we can represent the variational result. We also have to adapt the analysis. For this application rule, we kind of have to introduce another duration we call a type equation duration to make um, the application go through. And then we can see that the change is quite substantial. Then we have to also um, design a rule for typing choices. And then finally, we have to also adapt the unification algorithm to deal with variations. This is also the most difficult part of variational type inference. And in previous years, actually, a lot of such variational analysis have been created. They have type changing for different program syntaxes. 
and there's um, this model system and uh, data flow analysis, model checking, and also theorem proving, and also program slicing. So now suppose we want a variational control flow analysis, so we can um, envision the same four steps and uh, do this manually. But this is kind of um, tedious and uh, error prone. Now instead, we kind of move to this um, framework. So this framework consists of some basic ingredients. We first have these annotations. So annotations basically carry the information of analysis that's of interest. Um, so these uh, annotations are kind of sets of elements. So we have empty set and we have set of labels and I have set union and uh, this original set. So of course we have to make the, this definition extensible because in different analysis we need to carry different information. For example, in exception analysis, we have to say that exception types are these annotations. Then we also have this type definition. Besides the normal type definition, we also have to carry this annotation to types because now the um, analysis is done based on types. So basically during the typing analysis, we gather the information. And this type is always also made extensible through this type constructor to deal with uh, more advanced type features. And finally, the uh, uh, ingredient is the constraint. So basically, a constraint represents the relation between the analysis result of different parts of the program. And then we have true, which means always satisfied. And then we have the type equivalence relation between two types, which means these two types should always be equivalent. And then we have this subtype relation between two annotations. And then we have this variational constraint. And as well, this constraint have to be um, extensible for example, if we do type inference for type class, then we have to say that um, certain types are instance of um, certain classes and, and so on. Now here's how we put things together. So in this analysis, we basically pass in these three components and then we get these results as output. But in constraint generation, we kind of generate C. Um, here we put together the um, analysis for the application rule. So in the first two premises, we obtain the results for the first the function and the argument, and the third premise kind of specify the relation between the um, these two types. And the first fourth premise kind of express the relation between uh, different parts of the annotation. So we can, in many times, we can think that uh, psi four is kind of function of psi one, psi two, and psi three. But uh, sometimes we need something more expressive. For example, we may want to express the relation between psi one and psi two, and so on. And in fact, this um, RAPP and the side 1, side 2, side 3, side 4 is a parameterized constraint, which is instantiated for a specific constraint when we do this for specific analysis. And also, we have to do this for this um, choice expression. So basically, we obtain this um, result for uh, each alternative, and then we pack the result together and that is the NS result for this uh, choice expression. And here we have an important idea called non-interference. So basically we say the analysis of one alternative should not affect the um, that of the other. And uh, so that now we can briefly see this constraint solving. And we can um, have to skip the constraint generation because that involves too much uh, formalization. Now let's start with the first rule. So this is kind of the simplest one, and we what do we do? We just skip it, and uh, then we have to do with variational constraint because this is the kind of the constraint that we generated during um, constraint generation. Now the interesting thing here is um, we see that when we solve these two sub constraints, we solve them in the original context. So which is the idea of uh, split and uh, diffract the idea of non-interference. So basically we say the constraint solving of one sub-constraint should not affect the set of the other. And once we have the solution for both sub-constraints, uh, sub we have to merge them together such that uh, we can reuse computation in the remaining of the uh, constraint solving. And then suppose we want to do that for uh, the type equivalence relation between the two types under the same dimension. We, what we do is we basically push down the um, constraint into the variation. And finally, if the analysis is um, domain specific, we use this underlying constraint solver. So 
So this is kind of a simple example about the constitutional solving. Now what we do here is we follow the rule C and then we push the equation situation down into the into this di uh, dimension or into this variation, and then we cannot do the uh, rule B kind of do this split. So now we basically have two sub constraints to solve, and then in this in some of this sub constraint that we have to in invoke invoke the underlying constraint solver, which we assume something like uh, Robson's unification algorithm. And once we have the solutions for these two sub-constraints, then we have to merge them together. And in this side of this true denotes that uh, there's no residual constraint, which means constraint has been all solved. And finally, we got this result as the um, solution to this constraint. So this is uh, kind of basic flavors of the framework, but um, most details actually have been um, omitted for, for this talk. Now let's kind of look at how we instantiate the um, framework for different analysis. So first, for variational type inference, we basically don't have any extensions because um, in variational type inference, we don't have to carry any extra information besides the types. And also the types are expressive enough, but we, we don't have to extend the annotations and the types. But um, in type inference, we know that the fourth rule um, doesn't matter, which means we, we say that if the um, first three rules are satisfied, then the result can be uh, derived. So basically, we want to say the fourth rule is always true. And uh, what we realize is, is we assign that the parameterized constraint to be always true, and that um, the false premise will vanish. And for underlying constraints, solver, we kind of use Robinson's algorithm. Now, uh, let's look at how we get uh, zero CFA for the variational programs. So the first part of the instantiation is actually similar to that for the variational type inference, because zero CFA is um, fraud and contact insensitive. But now for this abstract rule, we needed to say that the label of the abstract is remembered in the, um, uh, in, in the function type. So we realize this through this um, parameterized constraint and it says that L must be a subset of the annotation of this function type. And then we kind of get this UCFA for the underlying constraint solver. And the UCFA is available from many places. Uh, for example, the principles of program analysis. And in the paper, actually, there are more instantiation instances for this framework. And we are doing some fraud sensitive analysis for this um, based on this framework. And here we see how we kind of um, evaluate the um, correctness and the performance of the framework. So actually, they have uh, formal proof of the properties of the framework, but here we are kind of more interested in the comparison with um, previous work. So since there are not too much work about variational analysis in the functional programming, so we have to in implement a further way Java version of this framework. And we compare this with a reference implementation from previous work. And uh, we run many test cases, and uh, we find something that is different for these two implementations. Uh, I've made this program particularly small because uh, this is OP program, and probably you're not interested in that. <laughs> so, um, but the output is actually important here. When we say that um, this program family is well typed, so the previous output says that there's some type error. And in fact, so we uh, manually investigate the um, situation and uh, find some bug in previous implementation, so which shows uh, a potential um, advantage of our framework. And then here, we, next we present some uh, performance because this is also um, something of interest. So we don't want the performance to degrade too much when we use this framework. So here we present four curves. And the first curve is the blue curve, so which is the analysis that is manually lifted, so which has um, least overhead and which runs fastest. Next, we present two curves for the two implementations of the framework. So we have two kind of slightly different implementation for the constraint solving. In the solid uh, green curve, we kind of solve the constraint very aggressively. Basically, we do, we do um, aggressive decomposition, and which is 
kind of correct for most of cases, and they give us very good performance. And then for the um, dash curve, it's kind of very conservative, but it runs for all the cases. Um, and we can see the red curve that is for the brute force approach, and which basically generates all the um, program values and apply analysis, and uh, unsurprisingly runs the slowest. And then this is also the performance for the CFA. We have kind of done this even evaluation. And the shape is essentially very similar to the one for operational type inference. So here we can see that uh, the two curves become more closer because um, one reason is that when the analysis of zero CFA is more complicated than type inference, we can say that um, the overhead uh, associated with the framework becomes less when it compared to the manually lifted analysis. So here are the basic um, ingredients of this presentation, but um, in the paper there are more information um, that we are not able to cover in this talk. Uh, finally, um, let me summar <coughs> summarize. Um, I will present this um, analysis framework so that which takes the input of the type system um, that uh, represents some analysis, and the output is the variational analysis and have um, correct behavior and uh, have decent performance. And that's my talk. Thanks. Any questions? So this is pretty cool. Um, it, your result that um, about performance, you, you had these two ways of doing things. You said, well, the more aggressive way uh -huh. of doing things um, doesn't cover everything, but has good performance. Right. So for the examples that you looked at, the ones that were important to you, did those all fit in the more aggressive one or not? They are uh, both uh, satisfy more uh, aggressive one. For example, for the pipe inference, we basically have to solve unification. So basically for uh, these type constructors, they are kind of free algebra. Basically we can do decomposition and then we solve corresponding um, parts of the type. So they are all um, aggressive approach for us. So, so you're saying yes, the aggressive yes. approach is perfectly fine yes. for type yes. analysis. Yes. And for zero CFA? Yes, this is also right. Right, so that, that's a nice result. And your um, framework, I like the framework. It looked, reminded me a lot of the um, type and effect systems, uh -huh. right? Your annotations look very similar to the behavior of effects in the type and effect system. So are effect systems one of the things you've tried to put into your framework? Yes, so we can, I try to uh, instantiate this also uh, for effect analysis. So this is, um, I haven't done that. So I don't know if I, this framework is expressive enough for doing that, but if uh, it's not, it, no, it, it's not probably I will like fully extend the framework and uh, incorporate that effect analysis. But yeah, it looks like it will fit easily. So yeah, okay. do it and write to me about it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Other questions? Then, uh, given that lunch is coming up, I think we should uh, thank the speaker. But before you do that, after we have thanked the speaker, uh, we have uh, some some more comments. But first, let's. Thank you.